This lecture takes a more theoretical look at uh, some fundamentals of machine learning, specifically, probably, approximately correct learning or packed learning. We're going to start to look at uh, what we do when we train uh, some model, empirical risk minimization, and then this notion of probably, approximately correct learning. Uh, and uh, we're going to look at that uh, in a theoretical context where uh, we have uh, a finite number of hypotheses in our hypothesis class. And then we're going to look uh, at shattering, shattering and the vapnik chevron Nankin's dimension uh, to apply this to continuous models where we have an infinite number of hypotheses in our hypothesis class. So previously we saw uh, this bias and variant trade-off. We measured it uh, empirically using bootstrapping and we saw this relation between underfitting, overfitting, bias and variance. So basically in underfitting our, uh, hypoth our model uh, is highly biased, generally with low variance, and when it's overfitting the reverse happens. Um, so the way we selected the best model was uh, uh, empirically by using cross-validation uh, and then we train with the, the, the training data and that way we balance bias and variance so as to minimize error. Uh, today we're going to take a more formal look at these problems, uh, not uh, as a practical approach. The, the bounds for the error we're going to calculate here are very uh, loose and not adequate for actual uh, practical application. But understanding uh, this theory gives us a, a more uh, uh, fundamental insight into how these things work and what is affecting the training of our models. So let's start with empirical risk minimization. Um, we uh, measure how bad our predictions are by some loss function. For example, the quadratic error, the Breyer score, the, the number of mistakes, something like that. So uh, we can consider the risk of uh, uh, some classifier to be the expected loss that we're going to have in the future. Uh, the empirical risk is the actual measured average loss. So we have uh, a, a set of points. We measure the, the loss function there. For example, how many mistakes the classifier does. And this is uh, the empirical measure of the risk. Empirical risk minimization is what we've been doing so far when we train the, uh, the model because we are trying to adjust the parameters to minimize the average loss on our training set. Uh, so we are using uh, the empirical estimate of the risk we are measuring on the training set, and then we are adjusting the parameters to minimize that. The true risk would be the average of the loss function over all the, the population, the possible data. We do not have the true risk. Uh, in, in the case, we are just measuring the, the error. This would be the true error. Uh, we cannot measure that because we uh, do not have access to the whole population. So in general, we saw that uh, empirical risk will underestimate the true risk because we are biasing it towards lower values in the process of training. Since we are minimizing the empirical risk, uh, by measuring on the training set and adjusting the parameters. Uh, in general, the, the uh, training error, for example, the empirical risk in general, will be below the true, uh, the true risk. So the question is, how far below is it and with what probability? So this is what we're going to consider now. And uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, these uh, basic uh, concepts of uh, uh, probabilities and statistics. So basically, if we have a set of random events, we know that the probability of any of them occurring, so the union of all of these events, must be uh, no greater than the sum of the probability of the events. So if the, the events are mutually exclusive and only one of them can occur uh, uh, and then the others cannot occur if one of them occurs. In that case, the, uh, this probability of any of them occurring will be equal to the, uh, the sum of their probabilities. But if there is some overlap, then the probability of any of them occurring will be smaller than the sum of the probabilities. So we know that the probability of any of these events occurring will not be greater than the sum of their individual probabilities. 
And uh, uh, if we have uh, events that are binary with uh, this uh, Bernoulli distribution, this means they, they can be 0 or 1 and have some probability of being 1. And if all of them have the same probability of being 1, then uh, this uh, expected value will be the, the average of uh, uh, overall the, the events. Uh, we know that uh, the measure in a sample of these events, of M events, will uh, be close to the actual probability of being 1. So when we measure the average over a sample, we get something that is close to the probability, the true probability of being 1. And uh, uh, Hoefting's inequality gives us uh, this, which is the, the probability of the measured uh, average, the empirical uh, measure there, uh, being uh, uh, below the, um, uh, the true probability by a value larger than gamma is below e raised to minus 2 gamma squared m. So uh, it will uh, re de uh, reduce, be smaller if we increase m and also smaller if we increase gamma and try to move away from the real probability. So this is for one side being smaller, also for being greater. The same thing so we can put the two together and uh, this would be the probability of uh, the uh, average that we are measuring there so our empirical estimate of the uh, the probability of any of these events being one uh, deviates from the true probability by more than this gamma so you can see we're going to uh, use this because this gives us uh, a way to relate the empirical risk that we are measuring. We can imagine that a classifier is a, a Bernoulli uh, variable that has some probability of getting uh, uh, um, the classification correct or incorrect. And we can uh, use this to try to uh, look at bounds for the dis difference between what we are measuring empirically uh, in our training set and what uh, is the true error for that uh, for that uh, uh, hypothesis so uh, let's look at uh, a bit more formally at what we've been doing so far this empirical risk minimization so we have a, a, a set of hypotheses that are binary classifiers that take some input x uh, and output 0 or 1 depending on the classification we have uh, a sample of M examples taken from this uh, uh, universe and uh, we are taking uh, them with uh, uh, this uh, probability distribution. So this is basically the probability distribution of picking examples at random and uh, getting uh, them like those that we have. Uh, so let's assume that this is always the same uh, probability distribution, that is, we are always sampling the same way uh, the universe and this would be the empirical error this is the training error which is the average over all the the training data the sample that we have of uh, this uh, uh, zero or one depending on whether the classification is different from the true class so we count one if it's different zero if it's not we average over that and this is basically the average error that we have in the training set now, the true error would be uh, the error measured for the whole universe when drawing examples with this uh, pro uh, probability distribution, which is just the way we are sampling examples from the universe. Uh, we cannot measure this because we do not have access to the whole universe of data. So, uh, we are uh, doing empirical risk minimization because we are going to try to find the parameters for which the empirical risk, the, this average measured on the training data, is minimized. Uh, we, uh, this, uh, the general problem of finding the best parameters is NP-hard, but we saw that different uh, uh, classifiers have different tricks to try to find the, the minimum uh, uh, faster than, than some uh, um, and looking at all the possible combinations so we have a uh, gradient descent and so on and uh, um, so in general in practice in practice we can solve this problem uh, in most cases and find a hypothesis that minimizes the empirical uh, risk 
but now we only have the the empirical measure of the probability of making a mistake and uh, this would be related to the true error by Höfting's inequality that we saw previously so um, classifying correctly or incorrectly is a, a Bernoulli variable the empirical risk we have is the the average of incorrect classifications on our training data and this relates to the expected uh, uh, average over all the data which is the true probability of uh, making uh, a mistake by Höfting's inequality so we know that the uh, with a probability uh, that is uh, below this value here depending on gamma and m uh, this would be the probability of our um, uh, empirical measure of the risk so our, our empirical risk uh, going farther than gamma from the true error so deviating more than gamma from the true error has a probability that is lower than uh, this uh, uh, amount here and this will depend on the size of our uh, sample so if we increase the size of our sample we will lower the probability of uh, going farther than gamma away from the true risk when we measure the risk empirically okay so this uh, brings us to the idea of probably appro approximately correct learning uh, in the this uh, uh, machine learning problem we have the universe of possible examples we uh, must learn this target function uh, for the classifier to map between any point uh, to zero or one this is the the hypothesis class that we're going to consider we're going to pick a hypothesis uh, b uh, in this class in order to obtain this classifier there is some distribution of probability when we draw examples at random from the the universe and we have a sample for training so our uh, learning system will receive this sample that is drawn with some distribution that we use to sample over the universe and it will select the uh, hypothesis from the hypothesis class that minimizes the empirical error so this would be the way uh, we are assuming our uh, uh, model is being uh, trained so we are going to choose one hypothesis from the hypothesis class that has the minimum uh, of the empirical error uh, now uh, it may be that the the uh, our hypothesis will classify uh, some examples as class one that are does not correspond exactly to those examples that uh, 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 belong to class one for example so there will be a, a, a true error here uh, which is the uh, the probability of making a mistake uh, the hypothesis that we chose gives us a class that is different from the true class when we draw uh, some example at random from the universe with this distribution so basically this is the true error it's the the average over all the, the possible uh, examples which is the probability in a frequentist uh, uh, sense uh, because the probability in this sense is the frequency over all the the infinite uh, possible uh, events so uh, uh, we have this true error we cannot observe the true error the true error is merely conceptual here we cannot measure it we cannot we can only measure the empirical error we can measure the uh, uh, error for the sample that we have by counting all those that are wrong and then dividing by adding the, those counts and then dividing by the number of examples uh, we cannot reasonably demand the zero true error because we do not have all possible examples in the uh, the uh, training set so there may be hypoth several hypotheses that do not make any mistakes in the training set but even so could make mistakes outside the training set and also some examples may be misleading there may be uh, some apparent correlation between features and classes that only occurred by chance in our sample in our training set and uh, uh, does not exist in reality so we cannot demand that the true error is zero we cannot even measure the true error and this brings us to the idea of approximately approximately correct uh, probably approximately correct learning uh, we uh, are going to train approximately correct 
classifiers, meaning that the true error of the hypothesis that minimized the empirical error is below some epsilon. Um, we are going to demand that it's, this epsilon is at most, uh, it's below one half. So we don't want things that uh, are incorrect more often than uh, flipping a coin or something like that. Uh, and this is probably approximately correct in the sense that we cannot guarantee that the true error will be below epsilon. What we can do is to say that the probability of the, uh, the uh, true error being below epsilon is greater than one minus some delta which is the probability of the error going above epsilon so the the reverse there and this delta we also want it to be small so we want a uh, better than 50 percent chances of having a classifier with a true error below one half this is basically what we, we what we can demand and um, and we have an efficient, probably approximately correct learning if when we uh, decrease the epsilon, that is decrease the true error or decrease the delta, uh, the probability that will go uh, above uh, this uh, epsilon in the true error, uh, we have a polynomial dependency on that. That is, uh, uh, the, the computational cost does not uh, increase exponentially, but only uh, polynomially as we try to reduce uh, the, the epsilon or the delta. So let's uh, look at this uh, from a theoretical perspective, assuming that we have a finite hypothesis class and that the hypothesis class contains hypotheses for which the true error is below epsilon. Note that if this does not happen, then this will never uh, occur because we simply do not have uh, the adequate hypothesis in the hypothesis class. So this is one assumption. There are good hypotheses in our hypothesis class. And we're going to train uh, uh, with examples that are drawn from the universe with the same probability distribution as other future uh, test examples. So uh, it, uh, we will not use a different sampling method uh, for training than for uh, future applications. So this is going to be the assumption so that we can uh, uh, estimate the, the probabilities of uh, being within these bounds. So let's uh, look also at a, a concept here, which is a consistent hypothesis. A consistent hypothesis is one that is consistent with the training error, that is, uh, with the training set, sorry, uh, that is, it will classify the training set with no error. It will not make mistakes on the training set. And the version space of uh, some uh, classifier, some model, will be the set of hypotheses for which the empirical error is zero. Uh, so we are considering that we have a finite set of hypotheses, this large H, and the version space of that uh, hypothesis class will be the set of hypotheses that have zero uh, training error, zero empirical error. Um, so we know that any consistent hypothesis gives us the minimum possible empirical error. And our cons uh, uh, a consistent learner, that is one that has consistent hypotheses, will give us one hypothesis in the version space because it's uh, uh, minimizing the, uh, the empirical error. And so uh, if we minimize the, sorry, if we minimize this uh, uh, empirical error here, uh, we will have, um, uh, we will obtain one of these hypotheses that belongs in the version space because this hypothesis has an empirical error of zero. Uh, and now uh, we also say that the version space is epsilon exhausted if all the hypotheses that uh, uh, are in the version space have a true error below epsilon. So the version space is the hypothesis that uh, the set of hypotheses with a zero empirical error, but it's also epsilon exhausted if the true error of all of these is below epsilon. Uh, if this does not happen, then it's not epsilon exhausted. But note that uh, uh, although the empirical error we can measure, we cannot measure the true error. So we do not know if the uh, version space is epsilon exhausted or no or not. So for any given epsilon, we do not know if the true error of all the consistent hypotheses is below that epsilon. Uh, but what is the probability that uh, 
there is no hypothesis in the version space with uh, a true error greater than epsilon. Because if there is one, at, at least, then it will no longer be uh, epsilon exhausted. But what is the probability that there are no hypotheses there with a, a true error greater than epsilon? Now, consider that we, we have a, a, a set of, of k hypotheses and they have a, a true error greater than epsilon. What is the probability of one of these hypotheses being consistent with one example? That is, classifying one example correctly. This probability must be below 1 minus epsilon because this would be the, the true error of the, the hypothesis uh, there. Uh, uh, so the, the true error of the hypothesis is uh, uh, below. Uh, the epsilon would be a, a bound for the true error of the hypothesis. So when we use one of these hypotheses that have a true error greater than epsilon and getting it to be consistent with one example, the probability would be below 1 minus epsilon because the true error is greater than epsilon. If we apply this to a set of m examples, then we just multiply all of these probabilities. We have this uh, bound here and the probability of uh, any of these hypotheses that have a true error greater than epsilon being consistent with m examples must be below 1 minus epsilon raised to m because uh, it must get it right for all of these examples without exception. So um, we have this probability of uh, uh, one hypothesis, at least one hypothesis uh, with a true error greater than epsilon being consistent with m examples would be uh, uh, summing, we would sum all of these events, the event of having a hypothesis consistent with M examples, over all the possible hypotheses, and the sum of those probabilities would give us an upper bound on the probability of any one of them uh, occurring. So we don't know how many uh, of these uh, hypotheses with an error greater than epsilon we have, because uh, we cannot measure the true error, so we don't know how many of these hypotheses uh, will exist in our uh, 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 hypothesis class. But we know that the number of hypotheses in our hypothesis class with an error, uh, a true error greater than epsilon, cannot be larger than the size of the hypothesis class. So this would be an upper bound on the number of hypotheses in these conditions. And so uh, we can... Uh, replace this upper bound with this, the product of the number of hypotheses in our hypothesis class, and 1 minus epsilon raised to the size of our training set. Uh, so this is the probability of being consistent with uh, uh, m examples, if it has an error of epsilon. Uh, since we are considering hypotheses with a true error greater than epsilon, this will be an upper bound on the probability of being consistent. And now we multiply by the number of hypotheses in our uh, hypothesis class, and this gives us an upper bound of this occurring. That is, uh, this is uh, uh, the upper bound on the probability that we have hypotheses with a true error greater than epsilon, and which are consistent with M examples, that is, uh, with which belong to the version space. Now, we can also do this uh, uh, approximation here. 1 minus epsilon is less than e raised to minus epsilon for any epsilon between 0 and 1. So we can uh, change this to uh, this expression here. And this basically gives us an upper bound on the probability of uh, uh, having one uh, hypothesis in the version space, which has a true error uh, greater or equal to epsilon. So this uh, tells us what is uh, the probability of uh, this occurring. So since uh, our classifier is giving us a hypothesis in the version space, we can consider this to be an upper bound on the probability that when we are doing the minimization, we did not discard all hypotheses with a true error greater than epsilon. Uh, so if we uh, change this and uh, call this uh, the delta, so this is the probability of going above uh, epsilon in the true error, uh, we uh, can uh, change this expression and uh, write it as a function uh, to give us a lower bound on m, 
which is the size of the training set. So basically, uh, if we want to guarantee, uh, if, or if we want to increase the probability that the true error is uh, below epsilon in uh, uh, our final, uh, the result of our training, so the classifier that we obtain, then we need to uh, increase m, uh, and we need a larger m the lower the epsilon is and the lower the probability delta that we go over epsilon in the true error. Also note that this depends on the size of the hypothesis class. So the larger the size of the hypothesis class, the larger the, uh, the sample we need also. But this now is a, is a this relation is with the, the logarithm of the size of the hypothesis class there. Okay, so this is uh, this is a very rough upper bound because we we uh, have always been doing these uh, substitutions safely so that we guarantee that we fall below this bound and it's not very useful in practice but it now gives us a a, a more found, well founded uh, idea of how these uh, aspects are related. Uh, so uh, we can also. Uh, uh, see this as a, a function of the the epsilon. So if you, if we can uh, uh, consider this the size of the hypothesis class, the delta and the m to give us uh, an upper bound on the the epsilon as we increase the size uh, of the the training set, we will have a lower value for epsilon, which is uh, the uh, bound on the true error with uh, this one minus delta probability. So basically, if we increase the size of the training set, we have a higher probability that the true error of the hypothesis we obtain will be below this uh, uh, epsilon. Uh, now, here we have assumed that uh, when we do empirical risk minimization, we obtain a hypothesis that has a, 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 an empirical error of zero. This uh, does not happen all the time. Sometimes uh, the, the best hypothesis that we get still makes some mistakes in the training set. But we can extend this uh, using Hoeftings inequality um, because we are measuring the training error here. So this is the, the empirical measure uh, of uh, the, the frequency of getting the classification wrong in our uh, training sample, in our data. Uh, but then we can relate this to the actual true probability of getting a classification wrong using Hoeftings inequalities. So the probability that the true error uh, of a, a hypothesis is greater than the empirical error of that hypothesis plus some epsilon is below e raised to minus 2m uh, epsilon squared. So this could be one way of finding uh, a boundary there. And also we can see that as we incre uh, increase the, um, the size of the training set, then we also decrease the probability that the um, uh, uh, true error is greater than the empirical error plus this epsilon. Um, so uh, if we want to uh, consider all the hypotheses on our hypothesis class, uh, we can now uh, consider uh, the probability of existing one hypothesis in the hypothesis class for which the true error is greater than the empirical error for that hypothesis plus uh, the epsilon. So basically we just multiply by the size of the hypothesis class there and now we can solve this for m and again uh, get a, a lower bound on the size of the sample that we need to ensure that the generalization error, that is the difference between the training error and the true error, is below epsilon with a, a confidence of 1 minus delta. So this is the probability 1 minus delta that we have uh, uh, fallen below epsilon on the generalization error. Um, and this, uh, uh, we see that it, it increases quadratically with 1 uh, over epsilon and linearly with the, the logarithm of the hypothesis space. So uh, if, we, um, if we increase the size of the hypothesis class, then we uh, increase the probability of going over uh, epsilon in the generalization error. 
Uh, now, we saw at the beginning that all learning algorithms need to have some implicit bias, inductive bias, in order to be able to generalize. Um, for example, we consider linear classifiers. The inductive bias there is the assumption that we can separate the classes with a, a linear discriminant. Um, and different approaches, naive base, for example, has this assumption that uh, the, the uh, features are conditionally independent given the class and so on. So in all of these classifiers, we made some assumptions in order to make them work. But what would happen if we don't do those assumptions? So let's suppose that um, uh, our hypothesis class is simply the set of all subsets of uh, uh, all possible examples. So we have a hypothesis class that considers all the, the universe of possibilities and all the possible subsets of that. So we can represent any possible function that maps from one example to 0, 1, because in that case it would be just uh, separating all the possible examples that are at 0, all those that are at 1, and that uh, uh, subset will be part of our hypothesis class, because we have everything there. So basically, for each example, we have uh, either 0 or 1, uh, and uh, uh, we must have this for all possible examples. So the whole universe, not just uh, a training sample. And the size of the, our hypothesis class in this case would be 2 raised to the power of the size of all possible examples, so on the, the number of all possible examples. Now, if we look at those bounds that we... Uh, uh, considered before, we know that we need a, a, a training set greater than this uh, expression for a given epsilon in order to have at most probability delta of going above epsilon in the true error. Uh, if we replace this with the hypothesis class there, uh, we get this uh, expression here. That is, we need a, a, a sample that is 1 over 2 epsilon squared multiplied by the size of, uh, by the number of all possible examples, uh, and then multiplied by the, the logarithm of delta. So basically, since these values uh, are uh, below 1, this uh, uh, fraction is greater than 1, uh, then we're going to need a, a sample size that is larger, significantly larger, than the, the number of possible examples that we have. Uh, and this is basically what we saw with the true base classifier, which uh, would uh, demand that we have a sample that is larger than the number of possible combinations of features in order to get a good approximation of the probability distributions. So you see, if we do not have this inductive bias, if we do not place some constraints on the hypothesis class and have a hypothesis class that allows us to represent everything about all possible examples, then we can uh, only uh, guarantee or have some confidence on the bounds of the true error if we have a, a training uh, sample that has more examples than actually the, all, the, possible, all the, the number of possible examples in the universe we are drawing for. Uh, so, um, this means that in practice we always need some inductive bias to reduce the hypothesis class in order to be able to train uh, our classifier. So, another thing that we saw is the bias variance trade-off that we measured empirically, uh, but uh, uh, let's look at this also from this perspective. Uh, we are obtaining the hypothesis that minimizes the uh, training error, but there is some generalization error here, uh, which is the difference between the empirical error that we are uh, minimizing in the, in the training set and the true error of this hypothesis that we obtained that we cannot actually measure. But the difference between the two is the generalization error, is what uh, the cost we pay for going outside the training data and generalizing for uh, other examples. Now, let's suppose that there is this... Uh, uh, H star hypothesis, that is the hypothesis in our hypothesis class that actually minimizes the true error. Note that we cannot find this hypothesis because we cannot measure the true error, but there must be some hypothesis there that minimizes the true error. Uh, now, we also know that the probability that the true error of the hypothesis that we chose that minimizes the empirical error uh, will be smaller 
than this uh, uh, difference here, so the, the empirical error plus some epsilon with a probability greater than uh, the one minus delta. So this basically gives us the probability that our true error is within this uh, uh, bound here and does not go uh, over the empirical error by more than epsilon. Uh, we also note that the empirical error of the hypothesis that we chose, this one, cannot be greater than the empirical error of the best possible hypothesis. And this is because we chose this hypothesis here, h hat, by minimizing the empirical error. So at best, the, the uh, hypothesis h star can have the same error, but uh, uh, it cannot have an error, an empirical error that is lower than uh, this h. We also know that the true error of the uh, hypothesis h star cannot be higher than the true error of the hypothesis h hat, the one that we chose here, because uh, by definition, hypothesis h star is the one that has the smallest true error. So combining uh, these two, we know that the probability uh, of uh, uh, the true error of h star being uh, bounded by the, the empirical error of h star, we have this uh, uh, delta here, and now we can combine uh, these inequalities too, and we conclude that the probability of the true error of the hypothesis that we chose by minimizing the empirical error, this h hat, being below the, uh, the uh, true error of the best hypothesis plus uh, two epsilon will be uh, uh, given by this uh, one minus delta and will be bound by uh, have a lower bound at one minus delta. So basically this relates the true error of the hypothesis that we chose and uh, the true error of the best hypothesis in our hypothesis class. And this tells us that the, the true error of the best hypothesis in, in the hypothesis class plus 2 delta is going to uh, give us an upper bound on the true error of the hypothesis we chose. Okay, so now we can uh, uh, replace uh, this uh, p with 1 minus delta there and uh, do this uh, separation. Uh, so we have these two different terms. Uh, the true error of our hypothesis with the probability 1 minus delta will be below the sum of the true error of uh, the hypothesis with the smallest true error in our hypothesis class. So this is that h star that we, we saw. Plus 2 times this, would be the, which would be the expression for the, the, the epsilon. Uh, we, we have the epsilon here. Uh, and so uh, we... Um, we have this uh, bound that is on the generalization error that depends on the size of the training set and the size of the hypothesis class. So here we can see the bias variance trade-off. If our uh, hypothesis class has a large bias, this means that we are probably going to have a large true error uh, in the hypothesis that minimizes the true error. That is, we cannot find in our hypothesis class any hypothesis that is really good at classifying the data. So if we have a large bias, we have uh, this uh, expression, this term here will be large. Uh, and if this term dominates and this one uh, is small, we have uh, underfitting. So our, our main problem is that in our hypothesis class, there is no good hypothesis, no hypothesis with a low true error. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we have a large hypothesis class, then we increase the probability of having a good hypothesis there, one with a small uh, true error. But now we have a problem with the generalization. We will have a larger epsilon here uh, because we have a large hypothesis class. So if uh, this term dominates here, we are in overfitting. Uh, and one way we can solve overfitting is by increasing uh, the size of the training set, for example. Uh, so we can see here that if we are underfitting, the problem is really with the, um, uh, the hypothesis class that we have. And there is nothing we can do there except changing hypothesis class. Uh, so if this term dominates, the hypothesis class is not adequate for this problem. 
But if this term dominates, we have some things that we could do. We can, for example, increase the, the trading set or maybe change some way we, in which we are choosing the best hypothesis so that we can fall closer to the one with the, the smallest uh, uh, true error. And this we saw previously, which would be uh, uh, having more data is always good, but uh, regularization can try to change the way we choose the, the best hypothesis. And so instead of just minimizing the empirical error, we add some additional factors to come closer to the hypothesis that is that has the smallest true error. But this gives us a, 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 a theoretical perspective on this bias and variance trade-off. Okay, but so far we've been assuming that hypothesis class is finite and that we can compute things with the number of hypotheses in the hypothesis class. This can be true in some particular cases. For example, if we have decision trees with a limited depth, then we have a finite number of hypotheses uh, if we have categorical features. But in general, this is going to be false because we're going to have continuous parameters. So every time we have continuous parameters, the size of the hypothesis class is infinite because we can uh, change uh, these parameters infinitesimally. And so these limits start uh, stop being informative. This is only a, a, th a theoretical approach to give us some uh, ideas of uh, uh, these factors that are uh, that influence the performance of the, the classifier, but cannot be applied in practice for uh, most classifiers that we use. So for continuous uh, uh, parameters, we need uh, to base ourselves on a different concept, which is shattering. So uh, consider these two classes, uh, the, the normal cells and the tumor cells, and the discriminants that we can get, so hypotheses that we can get, for example, for logistic regression or something like that. Uh, we have an infinite number of hypotheses uh, because we have continuous parameters, but there are many of those, or infinite also, that are equivalent in the sense that they give us the same uh, result in classification. So it would not make much sense to make a distinction between uh, these hypotheses that uh, are different, have different parameters, but will give us the same classification results. So the idea uh, here that we're going to uh, measure on the hypothesis class is not the size of the hypothesis class, but the, the shattering uh, power. So we can say that the hypothesis class shatters a set of points S if we can uh, obtain a hypothesis in, from that class that is consistent with S for any labeling of S. For example, suppose that we have these three points. We say that a linear classifier in two dimensions shatters these three points. If we can uh, obtain a consistent hypothesis, one that can uh, classify without errors the three points, for any possible labeling of the three points. So labeling everything blue or everything red is trivial. We can put a, a line outside the points. But if we label one of them red and two blue or two red and one blue, it's uh, the same thing. Um, we can always find a linear uh, uh, classifier that separates this correctly. So we know that in two dimension, we can shatter these three points uh, with a linear classifier. If we have four points, we can no longer uh, shatter them with a linear classifier because there will be uh, ways of putting labels that do not allow us to um, uh, shatter this, uh, 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 this set. Uh, so it will not allow us to find a consistent hypothesis with this set of labels. So if there is a way of putting the labels that uh, has no consistent hypothesis, then we uh, cannot shatter uh, that uh, set of points. Okay, so the, the Vapnik Chevronenkis dimension uh, of some hypothesis class is the, the size of the largest set that we can shatter with this hypothesis class. Note that there may be uh, sets that are harder to uh, uh, shatter, and so uh, we um, uh, can build sets with smaller with a, a lower number of points that cannot be shattered. For example, if we put two points in the same position, uh, two overlapping points or three points in a line and so on, then we can no longer shatter them. If we had, uh, in this case, 
for example, if we put the three points in a line and we put the red one uh, between the, the two blue, then we can no longer find a linear classifier that would be able to classify this. But the Vapnik Chevronenko's dimension is about this, the largest set uh, that we can shatter. So we can put the points uh, as conveniently as possible and uh, uh, check if we can shatter with the, that set with this hypothesis class. That is, for any possible labeling, we can find a consistent hypothesis. Now, uh, the, the demonstration for this is very complicated. I'm not going to go into that, but it's a similar approach to the one that we saw before. And uh, uh, it's even more rough, uh, uh, a rougher approximation, but uh, uh, it's demonstrated that there is a probability or uh, greater than one minus delta that the true error of the, the hypothesis that minimizes the empirical error is bound by the empirical error of that hypothesis and something on the order of this large expression here, which has the vapnik chevronenkis dimension and the size of the, the training data here. Uh, so this, uh, this logarithm will have uh, less impact than this fraction here, but basically we can see that uh, uh, this is going to increase with the vapnik chevronenkis dimension and decrease with the, the size of the training set. Uh, so this is the uh, the bound on the generalization error, which is how much additional error we have beyond the, the empirical error uh, to get to the true error. So uh, as we increase the power of uh, uh, our classifier, we increase the vapnik chevronenkis dimension, we also uh, risk increasing the generalization error and eventually this leads us to overfitting. So we saw with linear discriminants that we could increase the power uh, of the linear uh, discriminant by increasing the number of dimensions under some nonlinear projection of our data. Uh, so nonlinear transformation into higher, higher dimensions increases our ability to, uh, to classify the data. We did this explicitly with logistic regression in the beginning, but then we saw how support vector machines do this implicitly using the kernel trick. So it saves us a lot of computation time, but they implicitly do this transformation into higher dimensions using some nonlinear transformation. Uh, a linear discriminant in uh, uh, D dimensions can shatter D plus one points. So if we have uh, in two dimensions, we can put three points in a way that we can shatter with a, a, a line. In three dimensions, we can put four points in a way that we can shatter with a plane and so forth. So by increasing uh, the dimensionality, as long as the points are adequately placed, note that it's always possible to create uh, a set with a smaller number of points that cannot be shattered. And that is why it's important that we use nonlinear transformations when we are going into higher dimensions. Otherwise, it would not be helpful. But if we do that, we can improve the classification power by increasing the number of dimensions in our data. But of course, since we are increasing the uh, vapnik chevronenkin dimension of the, uh, the classifiers, then we, we need to take this into account. Eventually, we'll uh, start overfitting because now our true error will be significantly above the training error and we will uh, start having problems there. So to sum up, uh, um, to have a, a more solid foundation on probabilities and statistics in uh, machine learning provides us uh, with useful intuitions, even though in practice we are not going to use these bounds because they are very rough bounds and much wider than what we can uh, empirically get with validation and test sets, for example, we get better estimates. But uh, this shows us what, uh, what is the contribution of different aspects of our models uh, in uh, the various parts of the error that we are committing. Basically, there is the error because there is no hypothesis in the hypothesis class that is good enough for our data. And also there is the error that comes from generalizing from the training data to outside the training data. So we, we need to uh, play with those things in order to optimize uh, the results when we are solving machine learning problems. We also saw why inductive bias is necessary. Basically, if we have uh, a classifier that can do anything, then we will need 
much more data than the universe can provide us with in order to try to minimize the generalization error. So we always need to make some, uh, to impose some restriction on our classifier in order to minimize the, the flexibility uh, so that we can solve these problems in practice. Uh, we saw this uh, uh, connection with bias variance trade-off, which basically bias will be determined by how good the best hypothesis in our hypothesis class is in the sense of having a low true error and the variance uh, will then be uh, dominated by uh, the power of our classifier or the size of the hypothesis class. If we have it a, a very powerful classifier with a, a, a small amount of data, then we can have a huge variance unless we impose some additional restrictions on how we select the, the hypothesis. We saw this for continuous models and the same idea, but now we cannot simply count the number of hypotheses. We have to look at the power of the, the classifier. And this is the vatnik chevronenkis dimension, which tells us how many uh, examples we can shatter with that hypothesis class. Uh, note that this, uh, this uh, idea of probably approximately correct is very important in machine learning because we do not have a guarantee that we're going to have a classifier with a true error below some value. What we can do is increase the probability that the true error is bounded by some small epsilon uh, relative to the training error. So you can uh, uh, take a look at uh, uh, Mitchell chapter 7 up to, up to 7.4 uh, uh, talks about these uh, uh, hypothesis classes and the the um, case for the the uh, when we have a finite number of hypotheses in our hypothesis class. So Mitchell's book is now uh, a bit outdated, uh, but also you can find additional uh, details on alpidins on these uh, sections here.